Hello everyone, my name is Lynn Wilson and I'm the Operations Manager of the National Association of Disability Practitioners. This is a version of a presentation I did for the Association of NMH Providers National Meeting at the end of February 2021. Um, there was quite a lot of good information in it and I thought it might be useful to our members, so I thought I'd uh, record it for you. I started out as an NMH provider myself, uh, as a note taker, electronic note taker, and then I went on to become a mentor after some more training and then a specific learning difference tutor. I also did some uh, specialist exam invigilation as well. And it's been a steep learning curve at times. I started knowing very little about disabled activism and critical disability studies. Um, I don't think it can be underestimated how important CPD is for disability practitioners in our sector. Um, and so it, it helps people gain the knowledge they need and the understanding for really complex job roles. Now, first of all, I want to have a look at why language is important, where it comes from, and the models of disability, uh, how language varies and why, and then finally finishing off on what we can do. Okay, so why is language important? Well, Michel Foucault um, argued that the words and phrases that we use originate from knowledge, and the knowledge comes from dominant social figures such as judges, doctors, social workers, psychiatrists, etc., who actually have the authority to establish what he called as a conversation about social issues. I think we can add to that now. We can actually look at media, films and TV, internet and advertising. Um, going back to look at, say, maybe 1988, when the film Rain Man was published. At the time, there was very little known about autism in the, for the general public, and the rates of diagnosis were very, very no, low. And the film actually really increased knowledge and did a brilliant job. And in America, the rate of diagnosis increased fivefold thus getting people the assistance and help they needed um, to learn strategies um, and to access the education system. However, nowadays we look at it and we see outdated stereotypes. So things can grow out of date. The other one that's important um, and very controversial is advertising. Charities do some absolutely excellent work in supporting uh, families and disabled people. However, they also need to get money to do that work and they often advertise using stereotypes that disabled people are dependent and tragic. Um, and that is a real problem. Um, it hits hard at the identity and self-image of disabled people. So power operates through control. Language that suggests someone is different from you or that they have difficulties is what we call othering them. And it actually controls the way people think about disabled people. So what are models of disability? These are ideas of concepts that help people understand the idea of disability and they shape people's perceptions, sometimes positively and sometimes negatively. So one of the, the first models of disability is the moral or religious model. Um, it's primarily um, seen as a punishment for God or a test of faith. And that punishment for God, uh, from God can be for particular sins committed by the person, their parents, or even far, far ancestors. And words such as cursed and blame and possessed are often associated with this model. 
we don't often see it in the UK now. Um, still found in some fairly uh, strict theological circles. However, we may come across it in disability support when we work with international students. Some come from cultures in which some form of this type of thinking endures. And it can make it difficult for them to contact disability services and express their needs. One advisor um, was talking to me about the challenges that they were experiencing with a student who talked in terms of not needing reasonable adjustments as they were really working hard at praying away their impairment. Um, the medical model is very pre prevalent in the UK. Uh, we need to supply evidence to obtain DSAs and other reasonable adjustments and disability professionals may re be regarded as gatekeepers to reasonable adjustments. Um, and so that's a bit of a barrier between disabled students and the people are actually there to help them. Most universities in the UK actually look at the social model. So disability in social model terms is regarded as a, a socially constructed phenomenon which disables people with impairments. So any meaningful solution must be directed at changing society rather than individual adjustments and rehabilitation. This model developed in reaction to the limitations of the medical model and was inspired by activism of the 60s and 70s. But it's not without its critics, as some disabled people claim that they're not just disabled by their environment, but they also have impairments which have an effect and can't be ignored. So um, the latest development of, of some of these models is um, called the Affirmative Model, Biopsychosocial Model or Identity Model of Disability, very closely related to the social model, but actually shares the understanding that the experience of disability is socially constructed but the affirmative model incorporates a sensitivity to individual experience, including intersectionality. Intersectionality is really important. It's looking at the whole person and how they react um, depends on lots of things, their education, their upbringing, their culture, um, their financial status in society, and so it's really important that we consider the whole person rather than just a single aspect of their disability. So, OK, with language, is this just political correctness gone too far? No, definitely not. The way we talk to or about people reflects our attitudes and assumptions. Terminology changes from time to time because certain words and phrases take on pejorative connotations. Now, what I mean by this is words like spasticity, which is a medical term, which actually means there's a constant and unwanted contraction of one or two muscle groups. And it became firstly used to refer to people with cerebral palsy, but then it turned into an insult. And downgrading of terms like that is something we have to live with. And we need new words and phrases, not as a matter of political correctness, but because the old ones can no longer be used to respect, to reflect respect. Now, uh, my colleague, Nikki Martin, um, was cited an example of a disabled student who was attending a study needs assessment for DSAs. And his first comment as he walked into the room was that he was a special needs child. And he showed low self-esteem during the whole assessment and reported not having been particularly encouraged towards the university by his school. Now this lad had achieved five A levels all at grade A and was going to be attending a Russell Group University. So what we talk about there is the othering language that was used throughout his childhood had had a lasting effect on him. So when people are experiencing oppression throughout their life, 
they become to believe the stereotypes and myths about them that are communicated by a dominant group. They accept those negative images and they expect that their subordinate status is observed and normal and inevitable. So language in the UK changes dramatically, um, you know, let alone the rest of the world. So at school, we talk about special educational needs and disabilities send. At university, we talk about disability su support services. So what does your university call their disability support? I've been at a university and a student stopped me and asked me where the SENCO office is. Well, universities are working really hard to get over that language barrier um, in order to make sure that students are confident at finding what can be called disability support, disability and well-being, well-being office, um, access office. There's lots and lots of terms used out there. So we're well aware of the student confusion around there. Um, and it's bad enough in between school and university, but uh, colleges are dealing with both systems. Um, so when they have a higher education part to them and they have a um, further education part to them, they're using both systems. Now, a lot of young people feel that when they finally got into university and they've sorted out their DSAs, that's it, they're there and they can start relaxing. And I've had students say this to me. However, it's, there is a bit more of a problem to it than that. Um, Mia Mingus, who is a disability activist from Canada, I believe, um, she discusses the expectation that people have to share really very personal information just in order to gain basic access to things. So with um, our NMH practitioners, they will often find that students are not keen to share what their needs are because they may have already five times that day been into different lectures and the uh, lecturer is saying to them, oh yeah, but why do you need this reasonable adjustment? There's still quite a lot of education to do um, in that area. OK, this is the big one here. So person first or identity first. NADP work closely with colleagues across Europe via the LINK network and also those from the USA and Australia. Um, and one of the uh, language difference we come across first is identity first language or person first language. So in the UK, we tend to talk about disabled people, disabled student, autistic student, deaf student. This is, the identity is placed before the person, acknowledging it's a key part of someone's experience. It doesn't imply that their disability is their complete identity, but it's actually entwined with their identity. Most of the rest of the world, up until fairly recently, have wanted person first language. So student with disability, student with autism. So many of the theorists from the USA argue for that, saying that it's aimed at focusing on the person rather than their disability. So we see the term people with disabilities um, in many publications from across the world. However, this is beginning to change. I was on a phone call with Ireland this week and they were saying their young people are beginning to say, we don't want person first language. Our autism is part of us. It's nothing that can be detached like a handbag. It's something that's part of us and therefore we are an autistic person. So there's other language concerns out there um, and you'll be well aware of many of them. SPLD, specific learning difference or difficulty or disability. Now there's language, uh, there's reasons for all of them. Um, so 
NADP are using specific language difference, sorry, specific learning difference. And that reflects the fact that it's a difference in the way of learning. And there are challenges to overcome and strategies that are needed, but it, it's nothing totally different from the rest of the human race. Um, other people will actually argue for disability. And one of the arguments for that is the fact that we've spent so long saying, arguing for specific learning difference, that people are beginning to say that actually people with a specific learning difference don't need any help. It's not a disability. They just can get on with it themselves. They don't need any funding. They don't need any tuition. Um, so that's a bit concerning. ND, neurodiverse or neurodivergent. Well, this is one of the things that um, I've recently become more aware of. It was Judy uh, Singer's um, thoughts in Australia who started the whole neurodiversity um, discussions. But she's moved on from that now, uh, arguing that we all are neurodiverse. We're all different from each other. We all think in slightly different ways from each other. However, some people who are neurodivergent they are quite, as they think, in, in quite a different angle. ASC or ASD, Autistic Spectrum Condition or Disorder. We use condition. I um, much prefer the word condition. Um, I don't consider people on the autistic spectrum to be disordered. Um, the same goes for MHC, mental health condition or disorder. And then there's dyspraxia or developmental coordination disorder. <laughs> Don't get me started on ADHD. That is really quite complicated. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Well, attention deficit? No, you quite often get a very high focus with, um, in fact, hyperfocus. Um, hyperactivity, maybe, not always. Um, some people have the H, that's why it's in brackets, and some people don't. Those that do, it might be more of a amazingly fast thought processes than actual um, hyperactivity um, behavior wise. Disorder, no. Disorder means a lack of normal functioning or confusion. Um, and that doesn't apply to all the people I know with ADHD. Um, there's some uh, interesting uh, comments on some of the ADHD groups online about what it ought to be renamed. Everything from the more serious sensory input screening condition, which I think is quite good, or some rather uh, tongue in cheek ones. EFAS, easily fascinated adventurous souls and toast syndrome transfixed over arbitrarily selected things. The other language concerns that are out there is the difference that can really call, cause confusion between specific learning difference, which in the UK is used to refer to uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, um, amongst others. Um, Whereas in America, for instance, and Canada, they don't use specific learning difference. They use learning difference, which is very close to um, the phraseology we use for those with a general learning difference. Uh, basically that they um, are cognitively less active, I suppose you could call it, what we used to call mentally handicapped um, and no longer use that terminology as again uh, terminology has changed. In the USA and Canada, believe it or not, they still um, refer to those with low cognitive abilities as mentally retarded, meaning that their fact to um, their learning ability is slowed down. Um, which is fine, but I know when I was at school um, back in the uh, 60s and early 70s, um, there was a, 
you know, retard was a, a major form of insult. Um, so I really wouldn't uh, want to get back to that. So what can we do? Well, students have their own choices. They have labels that they like and labels that they don't. So respect what they want to call themselves. We have to realise that we're often working with young people who are growing up and growing in independence. I loved working in a one to one role with disabled students, especially those who were undergraduates. Um, they became more and more independent and learned about their own identities. And we have to realise that younger generations primarily come to understand themselves through what's given to them by their elders. So the first step to tackling internalised oppression is to positively portray the students' lives, abilities, and encourage critical and independent thinking. So their idea of their identity can actually change over time. Um, and this is about their identity becoming uh, being fluid, especially at this age. Other things we can do, read material with a critical eye, listen to training events and conferences with a critical ear, look out for othering of disabled students and challenge the language used if you find it. So, OK, the takeaway message from this short talk is that you need to relax. Basically, just relax. Don't be so afraid of saying the wrong thing that you don't say anything at all. Be willing to listen, be willing to communicate. Many disability professionals tend to be really work hard to be student centred. So they'll always see and respect and respond to the individual student, not their labels, not their abilities, not their impairments. And that way, they will create a space in which the student can find their own strength, creativity and purpose. If you get this right, then the language will just follow. So keep thinking, keep refining your point of view and keep challenging. And there's a few um, papers and, and things there that you might find interesting. Thank you very much.